You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is November 4, 2016, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, inhaled beta agonists. Our presenter is Dr. Amanda Rudert. She's an allergy immunology fellow in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to COLA. I'm Amanda Rudit. We're going to talk about Middleton's um, Chapter 95, which is about inhaled beta-2 agonists. Do I have a... Does everybody have one? All right. So, just kind of before we get started, this chapter was written before some of the more recent studies that just came out this past summer and fall about use and safety of combined um, inhaled corticosteroids with long-acting beta agonists. So we won't really touch on that a whole lot. So outline, we'll first go over just an introduction about use of beta agonists in general for asthma, the historical background of their use for asthma, the pharmacology of them, the receptor structure and activation, um, the efficacy of using these and safety of using these alone and also with inhaled corticosteroids, and then the use of inhaled corticosteroids and lava combination as single inhaler um, maintenance, but also as reliever therapy. So as you know, inhaled beta-2 agonists are the most widely used medication for the treatment of asthma, and they are known to rapidly reverse bronchoconstriction and also prevent bronchoconstriction in situations that are likely to precipitate symptoms in um, patients where it has provoke symptoms in the past, so exercise is the prime example of that. And uh, they're recommended by treatment guidelines uh, to provide relief of asthma symptoms. So they're classified into three categories. I actually did not know about the third one. Um, SAVAs, or short-acting beta-2 agonists, includes terbutaline and albuterol, and these have a rapid onset of effects but a relatively short duration of action, about three to four hours. LAWAs, long-acting beta agonists, are somiterol and promoterol, which are 12 to 24-hour duration of action. And then ultra-LAWAs are the extra long-acting, and I may say this wrong, I have not heard of it before, um, indacoterol, is that how you say that? Sure, we'll go with it. And the duration of that is at least 24 hours. I don't believe we use that in the U.S. So a little bit about the history of use of beta-2 agonists. In 1940s, um, inhaled epinephrine was found to provide some relief with bronchoconstriction in patients with asthma. And in 1948, beneficial effects from isoprenoline, which is also isoproteranol, um, the first synthetic inhaled catecholamine was demonstrated. Then modern beta-2 agonists that we use today were developed after they recognized that catecholamines exert effects via distinct alpha and beta receptors. And then following that, beta receptors were further delineated into beta-1 and beta-2 subtypes. And once they had kind of delineated those two different groups of subtypes for beta agonists, or for um, beta receptors, they were able to develop selective agonists triggering the beta-2 receptor in the lung. So the selectivity for the beta-2 receptor was improved by modifying the structure of, um, of catecholamines. And this resulted in the most commonly available SABA, which is albuterol, also known as um, salbutamol. Do they call it that in Canada? OK. Um, and then also tributylene. And several decades later, they were able to do other modifications, which affected the duration of action after inhalation. So specifically for salbuterol, that's derived from salbutamol or albuterol. And it was modified by extending the aliphatic side chain to modify the duration of action. And for motorol was actually kind of discovered um, by chance or serendipitously. Um, it was developed as an oral beta-2 agonist in Japan. And they just kind of found out that if you inhale it, it can have a longer duration of action. 
Um, so flumeterol is intrinsically long-acting, whereas the duration of a formoterol depends on the route of administration. That's one of the primary differences between those. And the binding of albuterol, tributylene, and formoterol to beta-2 receptors is similar to that of epinephrine to the beta receptor, but the nature of how salmeterol binds is actually controversial and not very well understood. So a little bit about pharmacology of beta-2 agonists and just really pharmacology principles and general concepts. So selectivity refers to the ratio of binding affinities to receptors in in vitro assays. And currently, all of the available beta-2 agonists have excellent selectivity for beta-2 receptors. Potency refers to the molar concentration of a drug that's required to produce um, a half-maximal effect. And efficacy refers to the degree of effect that's observed compared with the maximal possible effect in a system. So isoprenoline or isoproteranol is a full agonist on the beta receptor. Terbutaline and formoterol are almost full agonists. And but salmeterol and albuterol are actually only partial agonists on human airway smooth muscle in vitro. However, clinically, the, there's really no difference in the bronchodilator activity of albuterol and isoproteranol, despite them being different classifications of partial versus full agonists. So a little bit about the receptor structure and function. It's a um, transmembrane G protein um, receptor. So some of these are, not all of them, but some of the beta-2 receptors are activated just at rest all the time, a small fraction of them. And then when a beta-2 agonist binds to the receptor, it's G pro protein trimer GS, which is um, like the, the large component that breaks into a GA subunit and a beta gamma. So this is the total GS trimer. And then um, GA binds to and activates adenyl um, cyclase, which increases cyclic AMP, and that results in activation of protein kinases A and G, also known as PKA and PKG. And the PKA then phosphorylates myosin light chain kinase, which can sustain active tone in airway smooth muscle, so then that results in tissue relaxation. And the beta receptor also activates transduction pathways such as the sodium hydrogen exchanger regulatory protein without the GS involvement and couples directly to some potassium chains, or sorry, potassium channels linked to relaxation of smooth airway muscle and it targets rock or row kinases which are needed for contraction. So the beta-2 receptor is phosphorylated by G protein receptor kinases and then that leads to binding of beta arrestins that then desensitize the receptor by uncoupling it from GS, then um, the receptor is basically internalized into it completely and it's no longer a transmembrane and the receptor is um, recycled or it's destroyed by lysosomes. So now that you know all about that, we'll talk a little bit more about the structure. So in in vitro and in vivo, Studies have shown that the beta-2 receptor responses are antagonized by receptors that induce contraction, and that's mediated by GI and GQG protein coupled receptors, which include the cystinia leukotriene receptors and muscarinic M3 receptors. What happens is that results in a rightward and downward shifting of the beta-2 agonist concentration response curves for relaxing the airways with muscle. And what happens then is you get loss of potency and efficacy. And in uncontrolled asthma, that loss of efficacy is characterized by higher levels of contractile agonists in the airways. And um, specifically in severe asthma, increased IL-1 um, beta and TNF-alpha can uncouple the beta-2 receptor from these transduction pathways, leading to the decreased efficacy effect. So for SABAs, we'll talk about the efficacy of those first. Um, they do, for the most part, provide great reversal of the airflow obstruction unless the obstruction is very severe, in which case they're not going to do um, really anything. Activation of the beta-2 receptor can decouple the receptor from its transduction pathways, though, which can cause a loss of responsiveness with repeated or chronic regular use of SABAs. So 
that's kind of shown in in vitro assays, but it's really not seen as much clinically. And even with regular use of a beta 2 agonist for over a year, studies have shown that the degree of bronchodilation is, for the most part, maintained with albuterol use or tributylene. Um, and the intracellular mechanisms that cause this bronchodilation require only a small fraction of the beta 2 receptors to evoke a maximal response, and that's why um, that's why they believe that you still have good effect even when re with regular use. So another interesting thing about SAVAs is they act as um, you know, functional antagonists to protect against bronchoconstrictor stimuli such as exercise or um, inhalation of methacholine, histamine, and you know, leukotrienes. And it's kind of a counter counteracting effect that's rapid and onset and can provide more than 80% protection. But um, regular use of beta-2 agonist results in tolerance to this protection. So conversely to what's on the previous slide, this suggests more that um, for this effect, this counteractive effect, you have to have beta-2 agonists um, bound to a large number or a large fraction of the receptors. And then this shows, let me go to my, can everybody see that graph, okay. Um, this just looks at people who are not in any treatment at baseline and then people who exercise got um, either a placebo or got albuterol and those who are on albuterol baseline and then either got placebo or albuterol. So you have kind of the largest drop in um, or largest protective effect in improved FEV1 for those, it's green right here, I don't know if you can see it, for those who weren't on anything kind of at baseline and then took albuterol, they had the largest improvement pre-exercise or pre and post. So they went from here, got their albuterol, and then improved this much, whereas not as much effect was seen in those who were um, obviously not getting getting anything before exercise, the placebo, which is the purple and the orange here. And um, in some in previous studies, there were kind of flawed studies in their design. Regular beta-2 agonist therapy was believed to provide greater control than just as needed SAVAs, which is why for a period of time, regular use of SAVAs was a common practice. Um, then another study showed that using, is it phenoterol? I'm not sure um, how to say that one, but that's a more potent SAVA with more potent than an albuterol and has a slightly longer duration of action than albuterol. So a study using that showed that asthma control was actually worsened with regular four time a day use compared with just as needed dosing. So because of that, and then also discoveries that asthma is mostly an inflammatory airway disease process and, and needs anti-inflammatory medication, that kind of led to this chronic regular use of solids falling out of favor for treatment guidelines. Um, yeah. So then lavas were introduced quite a bit later, about 40 years later, in 1990, and large randomized controlled trials have demonstrated superior clinical outcomes when somiterol or fomoterol, the two lavas most commonly used, are added to an inhaled corticosteroid compared to outcomes achieved when an inhaled corticosteroid dose is doubled, as you know. And initial interpretations about the results of those early studies concluded that it was because LAVAs have some anti-inflammatory effect, um, but now it's been studied further and known that it's not really due to an anti-inflammatory effect, but rather that they are believed to provide some stability of airway function and increase asthma control that way, although it's still not very well understood why they work the way they do. So a little bit about the efficacy of just using LAVAs and using inhaled corticosteroids with LAVAs. So as monotherapy, uh, for motorol, it's rapid onset of action for bronchodilation and approved for acute relief of airway obstruction in many countries, um, not currently here in the U.S. And use of LAVAs for asthma treatment is 
recommended really only in combination with an inhaled corticosteroid, ideally in the same inhaler device. And then used in combination with an inhaled corticosteroid, um, lavas have been shown, as we mentioned before, um, to be able to provide better asthma control than higher doses of inhaled corticosteroids alone in patients whose asthma was not well controlled on lower doses of inhaled corticosteroids and also resulted in fewer asthma exacerbations. This was initially demonstrated in a study called the FACID study, which is a Formoterol and Corticosteroid Establishing Therapy study and has been reproduced um, several times in other studies since then. So uh, as we said, we're not really sure why LAVAs and LAVAs used with inhaled corticosteroids provide better asthma control. So they do, um, the LAVAs do stimulate the glucocorticoid receptor and promote the translocation of the nucleus, which increases corticosteroid-mediated gene transcription. Um, and corticosteroids also increase the transcription of the beta-2 receptor gene in the lung, so they kind of play into each other to help one another out with their effects. And reviews on the effects of LAVAs on inflammatory indices show that LAVA therapy is not anti-inflammatory, but it's also not pro-inflammatory. And the indices that they measured were induced cell counts, um, ENO, and then other markers of cell activation in sputum samples, serum, um, BAL fluid, and bronchial biopsy specimens. So a little bit about the safety. In 1948, uh, shortly after they started being used, concerns about SABA use in asthma um, arose due to some reported increased mortality associated with the use of nebulized epinephrine. However, epinephrine, as you know, is not selective and also has effects on beta-1 receptors, which can impact the myocardium as well. So it was attributed to some of those more cardiac effects. Then in the 1960s, in, in England, Wales, Australia, and New Zealand, they had increased asthma mortality in young people. And that actually coincided with introduction of um, isoprenoline or isoproterenol, which is a higher dose formulation and also non-selective. And then after that, New Zealand actually had a little more trouble. Um, there was increased mortality with regular use of phenotrol, which is that more potent, shortly longer or slightly longer acting um, than albuterol beta agonist. Um, and that mortality was higher despite those patients also being on an inhaled corticosteroid. So because of that um, use of those beta agonists, isoproterenol, isoprenoline, phenotrol, that's now discouraged. <clears throat> then um, the safety of using LABAs as monotherapy was evaluated by Nelson and colleagues. I think the paper was in CHEST in 2006. Um, and they compared adverse outcomes with the primary um, adverse outcome measure of death um, that was associated with adding cell meter all versus adding a placebo to usual asthma therapy. And the study was terminated early due to finding that a higher proportion of asthma and serious, uh, sorry, a higher proportion of asthma related deaths and serious adverse events occurred in the group who was taking the cell meter all. Um, also, they found that the African-American population in the study was also at higher risk, which they hypothesized was possibly due to some impact on the beta receptor genotype because they have some different um, amino acids, different structures for their um, receptors. But then they later determined that that risk actually just reflected the overall higher baseline risk of death in that population group um, overall because of their asthma. And Another problem with the study was that inhaled corticosteroid use wasn't recorded, and at baseline, less than 50% of the patients were actually on um, an inhaled corticosteroid. I think they said it was like 38% of the African Americans were on an inhaled corticosteroid, and like 49% of the Caucasian population were on an inhaled corticosteroid. And the deaths were predominantly in patients who were not on an ICS at baseline. So kind of dividing that up, and the ones who are not on an ICS at baseline, there were nine deaths in the somuterol arm versus none in the placebo arm, but in those who were using an inhaled corticosteroid at baseline and had that somuterol added, there was no difference in the risk of death. It was four and then three. 
Um, so we're not really sure why um, this use, as I've said before, maintains as a control. But um, one thing that was hypothesized is that not using an ICS and using a lot of lavas can kind of mask inflammation because you're controlling some symptoms and there's still inflammation that's happening that's kind of um, hidden because of the lava effects. So to study that, there was this um, 1998 study that looked at the use of somiterol with low and reduced ICS doses, and they found that somiterol can mask the clinical effects of inflammation, and they hypothesized that was by controlling symptoms just enough um, and maintaining stable lung function, but the sputum eosinophil count was actually rising. So they used patients who were on low doses of ICS or on decreasing dose of ICS throughout the study. So that um, then led to the Nelson study, which resulted in the FDA black box warning for submeterol and promoterol. And then after that, there were several other studies to further evaluate the safety of lavas as monotherapy and also lavas um, kind of added to inhaled corticosteroid therapy. And there were conflicting results and some issues with study designs. So um, kind of around that time, the FDA evaluated a lot of safety and did an independent meta-analysis of 110 trials and almost 61,000 subjects. And what they did is evaluate the risk difference for composite outcomes that included asthma-related deaths, intubations, and hospitalizations for patients who were receiving lavas uh, who were not mandated or were not required to be on a randomized inhaled corticosteroid. Um, and they found that that was significantly decreased or increased, whereas patients who were receiving a LABA with a mandatory ICS, the risk difference was not increased. And there were up to 44 deaths, 43 of them, um, actually death and intubation. Those were the primary adverse outcomes that they looked at, and they were kind of grouped together. Um, 43 of those and a lot of exposed patients occurred in trials that didn't actually mandate that the patients were on an inhaled corticosteroid. So that kind of set us up for um, the FDA to <coughs> mandate the studies be done for all the drug companies, which we'll talk about. Oh, it's on the slide, yep. So the FDA mandated that the, all the U.S. pharmaceutical companies that marketed any um, combination therapy with an ICS and a LAVA to do a large randomized controlled trial to evaluate the safety of those, which, as we talked about, just kind of came out and Middleton doesn't really talk about yet in this edition. Um, and another interesting thing, I didn't really know this before, is that earlier FDA guidelines had suggested that lavas that had been added to therapy to help gain control actually be taken away and stopped um, once control was achieved. However, that actually worsened asthma control in those patients, as you might suspect, since it was needed to achieve control in those patients. Um, I mostly included this table so that if you wanted to look at the studies, these are just some of the trials and studies that they mentioned. Um, some of these are ones where the, there were some flaws or problems with the study design. So we don't talk about those too much. So then in um, 2006, two studies evaluated a hypothesis that using an inhaled corticosteroid and lava combination for relief in addition to regular maintenance therapy for asthma could provide better relief than just using an inhaled beta agonist um, for relief. And they used either savas or lavas for the relief in patients who were using that same combination for their maintenance therapy. So initially that was evaluated with formoterol and budesonide, and um, it included a population with children and adults with moderate to severe asthma that was not well controlled on moderate doses of ICS, and some were also on a moderate dose of an ICS combined with a LAVA, and that was at randomization, and they had to have had a history of pre um, previous severe um, asthma exacerbations, I believe within a year. So what they found was compared to the patients who were taking the budesonide and promoterol plus a SABA for relief or the patients who were taking a fourfold higher dose of budesonide, like a yellow zone dosing, as 
what we would consider now, plus the SAVA for relief. The patients who used the enhanced corticosteroid and LAVA for maintenance and relief actually had a decreased frequency of severe exacerbations that required medical intervention like steroids um, um, or treatment like in an ER, and then reliever medication use as well as nighttime symptoms such as awakenings, and it improved their overall lung function. So I'm not really sure how using this decrease, these combinations for relief decreases uh, severity and decreases number of frequency of exacerbations, but it's kind of thought to be related to the timing of how asthma exacerbations evolve. So usually it takes about five to seven days for an asthma exacerbation to um, really worsen and to the point where patients will present to a provider or ED urgent care for further care. So the thought is that using these combination inhalers provides relief because um, anytime a patient has a little, some increased symptoms and they take the combination um, for relief because it's got their lava in it, they'll also be delivering a corticosteroid dose. So basically it's that they're getting more inhaled corticosteroids sooner on in the course um, before inflammation is more severe. Um, I think we just mentioned that. So. That pretty much wraps it up. In conclusion, as we know, inhaled beta-2 agonists are the mainstay of asthma treatment. They're incorporated into all asthma guidelines. SAVAs are the most widely used um, beta-2 agonist medication for relieving symptoms of asthma and also for prevention of asthma symptoms and bronchoconstriction. Regular use of inhaled beta-2 agonists um, can result in tolerance, though, to that bronchoprotective effect as seen like with exercise. And regular regular use of SAVA as, as monotherapy can actually lead to worse than asthma control and is not recommended. And then overuse of SAVA also increases the likelihood of asthma-related death and LAVA monotherapy without inhaled corticosteroids also increases the risk of asthma-related adverse outcomes such as hospitalization and death. So combination inhalers with ICS and LAVA help improve asthma control, reduce exacerbation risk, and allow effective maintenance doses at lower or effective maintenance um, and control at lower doses of the ICS. And they should be used in the same inhaler device because studies have shown that um, patients that have two different devices will preferentially choose to use the beta-2 agonist um, rather than the ICS if they're separated. And it's just easier to have one inhaler. Um, and then in patients with a history of severe asthma exacerbations, use of a combination that has famotidol for both maintenance and rescue treatments can result in greater reduction of the risk of severe exacerbations than approaches that use an inhaled beta-2 agonist alone for rescue treatment. And that's regardless of the baseline ICS or ICS lava combination that they're on for their maintenance therapy. And that's sort of controversial a little bit now and not done here, so didn't, I figured Dr. Port and I would want to chime in and talk about that. <laughs> so that pretty much wraps it up. Um, I know it's a quick topic, but does anybody have any questions or want to discuss anything? I do have a question, and I think I'll just to Amanda, but it's also to the staff here. So it's the last comment, or one of the comments in the conclusions, regular use of the agonists or the bronchoprotective effect. But, you know, my understanding going back to the other slide that you showed is I think it's regular use of beta agonists for exercise-induced asthma results in a bronchoprotective effect weaning off excessively fast, if I'm not mistaken, as Can opposed to not are, being sufficient to achieve the bronchodilatory effect. I think what this is getting at the down regulation of receptors, that the more you use short-acting beta agonists, you just have an internalization of those beta receptors. And so if you're overusing it, then when you actually need it, it's not effective. But, right, and because... But is that only for exercise-induced uh, asthma? Um, I think it's for anything that, like, any protective use. So if someone's going to be in an environment that has provoked symptoms in the past and caused bronchoconstriction using, like, in that setting as well, I think exercise is just, like, the main thing that we think of and primary example of that. So what do we tell people who have exercise-induced, or have asthma with exercise-induced bronchospasm or independent of that 
to, do we tell them to use albuterol before they exercise every time, or do we say you shouldn't have to use that if you're well controlled? Or should I rephrase that question? Sorry. No, <laughs> I think it depends on the case. I don't know what you do, Chris, but I, I do it case by case. I don't have mm -hmm. a standard approach. Kids who are triggered, I usually do say pre-medicate to every time. Every time, but you're right, you can lose some of that mm -hmm. effect once they exacerbate. But most of the time it's not every day. It's kind of a couple of days a week or in their season of yeah. football or whatever. It's not all the time. Okay. Well, and they define like the regular use as not just like a once a day. It was like a four times a day. Okay. So. so you know, the, pro the problem with exercise-induced asthma, if you talk to Chris Randolph, is that if you keep using the beta agonist, it becomes ineffective. Right, so, right. But how often do you need to use it before that happens? You know, one day even, one time, even if you use it one time, it's less effective the next time. So the, the tachyphylaxis happens really fast. Um, even if it's weekly, then it's a problem. So uh, recommendation is if you really have inflammation that's triggering the exercise-induced asthma, get the asthma under control so you don't need to use the bronchodilator so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of look at it as they're, they're two different animals. You've got your baseline asthma, you've got your exercise induced. Yeah. You control your baseline, then maybe your exercise is not going to be a problem, and I see that somewhat frequently in my patients. Mm -hmm. I don't have a way to monitor that other than report, but that's, that's kind of the way I see a lot of it. Um, and then there are some people, no matter what you do on baseline, they may not be obstructed, they may not have tons of inflammation, they may not benefit from daily use of inhaled or combo um, products. But when they get in the right setting, you know, as we move into winter season with the really cold, dry air, the big osmotic shift and all that, the bronchospasm is going to occur unless you protect them without be all prior to. So yeah. I see some athletes that have to have it certain seasons. Mm -hmm. That's why I always write as if needed in my plans on the pre-treatment for without be all. But certain seasons they're going to need it no matter what their baseline asthma is doing. Okay. So. And then one more question. I've had multiple patients recently, I don't know where this came from, who are on nebulized budesonide twice a day in the green zone. These are younger kids. And for some reason, their pharmacist tells them to use albuterol before the budesonide to make it work better, to open up their lungs. That's actually something that and I've seen yeah. where I trained a lot of the pulmonologists <coughs> would actually do. Yeah. For budesonide or then it's not going to get in as well. You're breaking up. Say it again, please. The, the old theory was that if your airways were closed, then the inhaled steroid wouldn't get in as well. In addition, it was thought that the inhaled steroid would be an irritant and would trigger asthma unless you stabilize the airways first with the bronchodilator. That turned out not to be true, but the, the tradition of recommending persisted. Okay. So it's not something where they are quoting a study. It was just an old... Thought. It was a blood tale, or a, a spouse's tale, excuse me, I'm being politically incorrect. Huh? <laughs> I think that's especially done like with cystics because, and I've seen like patients with CF and asthma, but they just routinely do all of their yeah. other medications and all their other like inhaled, like their inhaled Toby and other NABs after albuterol. After albuterol. Yeah. Well, it's not a like bad idea. Yeah, but in the case of asthma, does that qualify as regular use of the SABA that will then decrease its effect? Yeah, when yeah, you probably. Right. probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so I'll throw something out here, too. So sure. in patient management, we use albuterol when they come in. We stick with albuterol throughout the whole stay. We don't use lavas. Um, when one albuterol doesn't work, we'll repeat it. And then after mm -hmm. a while, we put them on continuous. And we leave them on continuous until whenever they're mm -hmm. doing well. Yeah. Right? So... Somewhere in, the, in that whole balance, you have to say, when am I doing more harm by hitting them with more albuterol? How many receptors can you hit? Are you downgrading uh, the, the, um, the number of receptors available? Are you going to lose your effectiveness and you're just going to produce more tremor, tachycardia, and things like that? Yet that's what we do. And then we just forget, well, why aren't we using like a, a lava in some of these cases? Uh, think about RTs. We run short on them. We actually bring in traveling RTs in the wintertime because we can't hire enough locally, and we pay a fortune for that. So why aren't we thinking about lava management on the inpatient? I wonder, though, if it's just uh, going back to what Amanda said, that you may be asking, you know, 
ongoing problems by using the last aggressive. Right? And masking in the hospitals. Well, if you're supposed to be in charge, like, you know, giving them lavas and then eight hours or 12 hours. Yeah, but later, what else are they getting when they're in the hospital? Steroids. Right. 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 So you're doing everything you can for them. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're not preventing anything. Well, it's funny, in our fellowship, um, in my fellowship, we actually, all the inpatient teams would always stop their LABA immediately when they came inpatient right. because they were actually concerned that that would be causing more downregulation of the receptors while they were on continued salbuterol. So to me, I was just kind of <laughs> like, it's a wash. I don't really yeah. think it's going to make a difference either way. Yeah, that makes you scratch your head a little bit. Yeah. I, I, I think half of the thing we're doing is we're, we're buying time and we feel good by just dumping a ton of it into yeah. them. I don't know if we have a, a, a better way to study and look at that who's not going to do it right now, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I really we're just waiting for the steroid to take in. And yeah. what, what's the usual turnaround time length of stay for an asthmatic that hits our floor? 1.3 days. Yeah, it's somewhere around, yeah. around two yeah. or so. Oh, okay. How long does it take for the, the steroid component to have a... a significant effect. About that long? Yeah. <laughs> so I think we're really make, waiting for the, the oral steroid or systemic steroid to kick in and do its job. Meanwhile, we feel good about just trying to recruit every camp. But as, as you mentioned in the study, too, with the, the beta agonist, it doesn't take a, you don't hit every receptor to get maximum effect. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just keep thinking, oh, I don't know, maybe we're recruiting that small extra percent to make, make a difference. But right. I scratch my head on the inpatient management. I don't have a right answer. I don't know how you study it easily. Because yeah. who's going to volunteer their child and right. not get standard of care? Yeah. On mm -hmm. that? You, you may be able to study just LABA only and not short acting. And if you're doing a LABA do, one that has some quick onset action, right? For me to roll compared to mm -hmm. meter roll, which takes a little bit of time. Yeah. But um, anyway, it, it, it'd be interesting to see if we could find a different way because I, I just look at the cost issues of mm -hmm. hanging out on continuous out meter roll and RT going back and forth over and over to, yeah. to manage them. Yeah. Well, we had those kids last year, or was it two years ago, with EV68, and yeah. they got like yeah. Yeah. plus hours of continuous yeah. out meter <laughs> It's a pretty um, period viral? strain of enterovirus. Yeah. Yeah, that cause wheezing in uh, non asthmatics and asthmatics yeah, as well. Um, um, neurologic, neurologic symptoms. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see. Just like without asthma, like, like inflated yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. destruction. Yeah. As a side note, it's really interesting looking at length of stay in socialized medicine countries. Because Canada actually has the length of stay for asthmatics four to five days. Really? Huh. There's a lot of like push national push discharge. here, yeah, to like, yeah. have efficient treatment and discharge. But it'd be curious to see if there's any difference in rebound rates. Yeah. 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 Maybe that saves on rehospitalization. Do you ever send kids home on oxygen if they didn't need it? For the bronchiolitis, mm -hmm. after 10 days, um, uh, inability to lean off. Yeah. Similar to what you guys do. They gotta be off. Yeah. No, Here they have hormone oxygen oh, in yeah, a yeah, while, yeah, especially yeah. if they're like... Except old bronchiolitis or the off-oxygen? Here they have, yeah. Mm -hmm. In Colorado, we sent them home. Really? A lot. Yeah, we <laughs> but them like, them yeah. we would send them home, like, I can think of a couple of kids with Down syndrome who, like, they just could not... Yeah. I don't think there was, like, yeah. a 10-day cutoff, but it was like, okay, they've been here for two weeks or so, and they're not weaning off, so... Yeah. Like, if they're 10-day cutoff, like, well, um, the African American part that you had brought up earlier, and that um, you know their risk in the black box warning, you know that their asthma deaths were higher than those who were not on ICF. And I've seen other studies that show, like that look at clusters of patients, like who would respond better to what therapy. And I've, I found a lot that African Americans respond; they're um, more exquisitely sensitive to steroids and mm -hmm. cases. And then the cluster groups that they do better on the higher doses of inhaled steroids and versus a combination. Yeah. So it just made me think when you were bringing up that data. And I don't know, clinically I've done that in a few cases, you know, tried mm -hmm. pumping up their inhaled steroids, but then you do get worried about secondary effects if you're going too high, so you want to do right. steroids sparing too. But anyway, so I thought that was... Yeah, the, the chapter discussed that a little bit more in depth. It's, um, there's like a variation with like the R gene, R gene position 16 on the beta receptor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
but you also got to be careful when they do cluster analysis because the original study is powered for the big picture. Right. And when you do subset analysis, yeah, was it yeah. powered for that? Is that right. not? And yeah, it's definitely worth paying attention to and it spins off the next study. Type yeah, I mean, like the SARP, is it SARP? Or, I don't know, there's a whole cohort that was that's looking at the severe asthmatics and look, looking to see if you can cluster them and see. But you're right, I don't know how they powered it, but I think it was a pretty large cohort. So I was trying to see how you can better treat some of these. I mean, it's all going towards personalized medicine, you know, mm -hmm. and whoever walks in your door based on their ethnicity and this and that, you know, yeah, how you can, <laughs> yeah, exactly better treat them. But. Yeah. Anyone know where the FDA stands on possible approval of smart therapy? A single maintenance reliever. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the combination. Yeah. Like the yeah. So it's, Amanda mentioned it. She just didn't put the acronym. Single inhaler maintenance and reliever therapy. They call it SMART. <laughs> it's kind of like dynamic dosing using a single inhaler like Dulera or Simbacord. It's what I do all the time. Yeah. Um, the so where, yeah. I'm not going to approve it because they don't approve adjustable dosing for inhaled steroids. Uh, the, okay. the director of the FDA has publicly stated that they're just never going mm. to approve. Okay, even with all the studies showing how well it works. Um, the guy's got to retire and a new FDA director of uh, of uh, <laughs> Hale and Edison's needs to come on board before that will happen. Okay, I did um, when I was working with our at our adult palm clinic one day. Um, I brought up possibility of trying dynamic dosing with an adult patient and Here? yeah, they were really reluctant to do that and kind of attributed it to possible cardiotoxic effects of that much beta agonist, even though it's beta 2. They so, worried about the effects of the asthma that's uncontrolled? I guess not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. The thing is, the FDA does not regulate the practice of medicine. It regulates what drug companies can have as an indication on their package inserts. And so drug companies are restricted by the FDA. Once a product is approved, you can use it to treat patients any way you think is clinically useful if you're using your clinical judgment. The FDA does not regulate what you do with the medicines. Can you see any reason? like in an adult patient with possibly some cardiac issues to not do dynamic dosing? Um, I would, um, first of all, disclaimer, I'm not an adult allergist. I'm, I, I am an adult and I am an allergist, but I don't treat adults. It's <laughs> be the question whether I'm actually have obtained adulthood and behavior, but that's a different issue. Um, Personally, I, I'm, I'm more concerned about the asthma being uncontrolled. Uh, and if yeah. you have uncontrolled asthma, if you're hypoxic, if you're wheezing, and uh, if dynamic dosing can give you better effects, I think that's worth the try. Um, so mm -hmm. no, I'm not as concerned about the cardiovascular effects. Yeah, I think the alternative that we opted for was just... Oh, sorry, what? These guys pump on their albuterol all the time anyway. What about the cardiovascular effects of that? Right, and the alternative that we asked for was just using more albuterol and doing baseline like maintenance um, oral steroids like, daily. I love that if they use the beta agonist. Yeah. <laughs> no, I thought so too. Yeah, they just didn't know, mm -hmm. and so they were just mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Maybe a function of just unfamiliarity with the procedure. When you, mm -hmm. when you start something that you've never done, you're very uncomfortable because you're not familiar with it. You, you feel better if you see other colleagues already doing it and telling you that it's okay. Mm-hmm. One thing that makes you uncomfortable too is the package insert, I think, says mm -hmm. do not exceed more than four puffs per, per day. Right. And so that, you know, that's concerning that yeah. something bad outcome did happen. And, you know, but, um, if you look at Oregon, if you look at Floridale, which is from Adderall by itself, you can you can exceed four puffs a day. You just can't can't exceed four puffs a day if it's mixed with an inhaled steroid, which I don't understand. Why does it suddenly become less safe when it's mixed? Hmm. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. Do you know why it's labeled that way, Dr. Portman? Is that why the four puff like the massive four puffs? Because that's how the studies were done. 
And so if you do a study a certain way, then you have to always do it that way. It's sort of like um, with sublingual immunotherapy is indicated that you have to prescribe an EpiPen or an epinephrine auto-injector for patients when they do sublingual immunotherapy at home. They don't do that in Europe. There's never been a fatality from sublingual immunotherapy. There's no reason at all. It's just that during the clinical trials, they did it and because IRBs wanted to, you know, have the patients be really safe. Because they did it during the trials, the FDA made them put it in the package insert, even though it's really not necessary. So there's a lot of artifacts in our uh, medication uh, labeling systems. So if the indication in the United States is different than Canada, you prescribe here and they cross over into Canada, you have to change the frequency of use. <laughs> yeah, you can do it four times a day in Canada, just not in the U.S. Yeah. Well, you got to get a good Canada's pharmacy. going to have a population surge in about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> that was a stouter population of people so they can handle it.